So Muli looks like a rising star in Bitcoin uh, slash CS, and he will be, uh, so he's now both on the digital and the way to start for GSV, so he will be local the next year. He's going to talk about adaptive model. Thank you so much. Wait till the talk. <laughs> um, so yes, the title of this project is Adaptive Monopoly Regulation, and this is based on joint work with Jason Hartline and Alec Johnson at Northwestern. I presented this uh, two years ago at the Fox conference, and what you're going to see today is a new application and new results that I'm presenting here for the first time. Um, I think this is a great place to present these results for the first time. So um, I'm going to start with an observation, which is that uh, economic conditions, market conditions, can be very difficult to predict. They can change constantly. And in fact, regulators seem to have difficulty anticipating these changes in practice. So one example is the recent surge in inflation. The Federal Reserve does not seem to have predicted the intensity or the duration of the surge. Another example is the catastrophic failure of the power grid in Texas about a year ago. So the Texas energy regulators don't seem to have you know, uh, anticipated the possibility of this kind of weather event or prepared for it properly. Third example, you know, with the war in Ukraine, natural gas prices have uh, spiked, um, and we see, uh, well, we expect that regulators probably didn't have a you know, perfectly accurate model of this geopolitical event. Um, and finally, to take a local example, Proposition 13 here in California, passed in the 1970s. I expect that voters in the 1970s did not perfectly anticipate what housing market conditions would look like in California today. So with these motivations, um, the high-level question that I'm going to be pursuing is can regulated markets adapt to economic conditions, even if those conditions are unpredictable and constantly changing, by uh, using access to market data and given enough time? So in other words, even if we're in a wildly unpredictable environment that we don't really understand, can we still regulate markets effectively using data that regulators in practice are likely to have access to and assuming we have enough time to adapt? Now, uh, I'm going to be pursuing this high-level question in the context of the particular application called monopoly regulation. Okay, And this is a market where there's a single monopolist. Uh, maybe there are a lot of fixed costs uh, to entering the market, and so you can't have more than one firm. Um, the setting is uh, one regulator, one firm, and then uh, consumers, many consumers. So we can think about them as arriving uh, in sequence over time. Now, the tension in monopoly regulation is that the firm cares about profits, while the regulator cares about welfare. Um, we have the usual problems with market power, right? So the firm is incentivized to set prices uh, inefficiently high, which is going to sort of keep some consumers who might value the product from getting it. In this kind of market, you need to use some kind of regulation uh, in order to uh, get something approaching efficiency. Now, uh, this problem has been studied before. A you know, famous paper by Baron Meyerson uh, took the mechanism design approach to understanding this question. We're going to be taking an approach that we call adaptive mechanism design. And the approach is going to bring adversarial online learning uh, to mechanism design. Some qualities, qualities of this approach that I just want to highlight, we're not going to make any distributional assumptions. Okay? So if we think about demand as evolving over time, we're not going to assume that it's IID. We're not going to assume that it's stationary or Markovian or ergodic. We're not going to make any assumptions whatsoever. We're not going to assume that the regulator knows this uh, distribution. We're not going to assume that the regulator has detailed knowledge of the firm's strategy. And we're not going to assume that the firm has uh, distributional knowledge. What we are going to do is introduce solution concepts that neither exclude the possibility that the firm has prior knowledge, nor require the firm to have said prior knowledge. And we're going to design regulations that are effective in a robust way, uh, given these solution concepts. OK, so uh, what's the you know, upshot? What, what are we going to be able to actually tell you about how to regulate markets? Well, we're going to propose what we call customer first regulation. Okay. Um, and this is a form of regulation that has, you know, forms of it have been floated before, um, but it hasn't actually been implemented in practice. And I think, given the results that we have, maybe we should be. So customer first regulation at a high level is saying we want to incentivize the firm to prioritize the well-being of the customer. It's very simple. We're going to have a subsidy and a tax. The subsidy will be proportional to the estimate of the consumer surplus. In this case, 76% of consumer surplus will be, uh, of the estimated consumer surplus will be offered as a subsidy to the firm. 
the tax is going to be 12 percent of the gross profits that is profits before the subsidies and for taxes um, now this is a pretty simple regulation um, and our environment is a very adversarial one so the question is can this possibly perform well and uh, somewhat surprisingly um, our first theorem is going to say that yes uh, customer first regulation guarantees 86 percent of the first best welfare that's much better than other practical forms of uh, other forms of regulation used in practice, at least when applied to our model. Uh, and this again is going to uh, uphold without requiring any prior knowledge from either the regulator or from the firm. Now, of course, uh, eighty-six percent for me is pretty good, um, and there are many computer scientists in the audience, so I'm sure they'll be okay with that. But as an economist, I have to ask: Is this, you know, the best? Uh, is this the best we can do? Um, and the answer is uh, close. All right, so I'm going to show in theorem two that no regulation is going to guarantee more than 89% of first best welfare. Um, and that's true even if the firm knows the data driven process. Um, so I actually, I think we can probably uh, tweak the regulation to get theorem one to say 89% as well, um, but I don't have that for you today. Now you might wonder why are these numbers so specific, right? Uh, this is a theory talk. Um, and basically our results are going to depend on some parameter. The parameter is what's known as a shadow cost of public funds. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, and I just, you know, for this slide, I just plugged in an empirical estimate of that. Thing. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'm going to skip over related literature just in the interest of time. Um, but well, we've seen even some related literature today or you know throughout this week at the workshop. Um, you know, Alex's uh, paper on uh, incentivizing exploration is in there. Yeah, go ahead. Just to make sure I understand. Yeah. But a mini max or anything, it's like calibrated on a certain assumption for the structure of the market or something. Is that right? Um, it's going to be so we're going to say that the regulators regret relative to a class of alternative strategies is going to be low. Um, but if you look at the results, what you'll see is like um, given whatever information the firm has, right? Um, if you think about the first best as being the regulator takes over the firm and somehow is able to be as effective as the firm in management. And then you're going to get 86% of that as a guarantee. But the parameters and steps come from data, come from some. The parameters, as in like the demand and cost and so forth, yes. those are going to be uh, generated uh, adversarial. Oh, adversarial. Okay. All right. So the question the Yes. So, so we'll get to that. Um, not necessarily. So depending on this shadow cost of public funds, which is like an exogenous parameter, you might run a budget deficit or you might run a budget surplus. Right? If you ask me to run not run a budget deficit, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure you can get any kind of meaningful guarantee here. Um, but the idea here is, and this is sort of consistent with some uh, earlier work from Tyrol and other uh, funds, um, the idea is that we're going to model budget constraint as being soft, right? So you do you are you are able to fund finance a budget deficit by sort of using taxes elsewhere, but those taxes elsewhere are going to involve distortions, and that's going to be captured by this prem. Yeah. So I think we have a pretty flexible way of dealing with budget constraints, but we're not going to be imposing hard budget constraints. Okay, so let me talk about the model. So uh, we're going to be dealing with a repeated game. Um, there's one regulator, one firm, and then many consumers think about uh, capital T periods in each period one consumer arrives. Uh, we're going to let capital T go to infinity uh, pretty soon. Here's a sort of diagram that just shows how the game proceeds. Uh, you know, at the beginning of period T, nature is going to choose some value for the consumer, VT. This is like how much you're willing to pay for the product. Then the firm will set a price PT and a level of effort, ET. Effort is like managerial effort. Right. How hard is the CEO working to make sure that the firm is running as efficiently as possible? Then the consumer will decide whether to buy the product or not. The quantity purchased, XT, is just zero or one. Then nature will choose the cost of production or the cost of serving the consumer. Uh, it's a cost function, CT. So it maps the level of effort to some cost. Uh, and CT of ET is like the realized cost. And then finally, the regulator is going to choose transfers for the uh, firm and then transfers for the consumer. How F and Tesla. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, our model is going to allow for the possibility that the firm is not able to perfectly predict its costs. Right. So it could not turn out that the costs are a little bit higher than expected. 
um, which it makes sense. I mean, we're talking here about like each period is one consumer, but if you think about like each period is one month, you know, it could be that price fluctuations in that month or cost fluctuations in that month uh, cause your you know, uh, cost of money to be different than expected. Um, but our, our results are still going to allow for the possibility that the firm is able to perfectly predict these costs. Okay. Yeah. Well, my effort today could sort of lead to cheaper cost next period. There's sort of no assumption there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we're not going to be modeling that, but it's a very good point. So what we're going to assume is that your effort in period T might reduce your costs in period T, but there's no spillover to the next period. Okay. So the regulator strategy, SR, is going to map the observable history to the transfers. Okay. Um, what is the observable history? Well, basically everything not in gray. So you're going to observe the price, the sales, and the realized costs, which is data that regulators in practice tend to have access to, at least in developed countries. You're not going to observe the consumer's value. You're not going to observe the effort of the management. And you're not going to observe the cost opportunities that were not uh, taken advantage of. Sorry, I think I missed something. Yes. Effort going to X. What is the effort doing? Effort, yes, yes. So CT, the cost, is a function of the effort. No, the function. I guess I just want to know what the effort choice is. The effort choice affecting the quantity of trade. No, the effort choice is coming into the, the cost. So uh, you might. It's always hard to see how big the medicine room. Um, but you see the second cost in black there is C T applied to E T. So the actual cost that the firm pays is going to depend on the effort that they put in. Okay. Still there. Let's keep going. Okay. So let me know if I can clarify. Yeah. Should we think of the cost as xt times that? So like there's only oh, cost. Oh, yes, that's that's it. I see. Yeah. So the costs are only incurred if you serve them. So. Ah, that's right. That's the effort but the sale. Um, no, but you know, if you uh, if you're the firm and you put in a lot of effort, and for that reason you can reduce your price, then that might indirectly affect the sale. But the effort is not going to like improve the quality of the good. It's purely just going to affect the cost of the good. So conditional on price. Um, Cost effort doesn't matter. So, so just to clarify, you only pay the cost. Only pay the cost if there's a sale. Yes. Yeah. What is the transfer doing? The transfer we're going to use to incentivize the firm. So we can think about taxes or subsidies or penalties. What's the meaning of F and C? F is firm. C is consumer. So transfer to. So transfer to F is a transfer to the firm. And transfer to C, if you want, is a transfer to the consumer. What is we see? The value of the willingness to pay for the product. Ah, okay. So is there a fixed relationship between speaking and GP or is that kind of a specific So the, uh, and I'll specify right now. So the firm strategy, SF, is going to map the observable history to prices and effort. So um, the you know, firm will decide what the prices are. And one thing they might take into account is how much effort they have. I see, but they can determine these independently. So it's not that the price depends directly on the not, not directly, although optimally for the firm, you don't want to, you know, if you put really low effort and your costs are really high, you don't want to set a low price or otherwise lose money. Yes? Is, uh, how, how does the effort affect, like I understand effort affects cost. Is, it is the cost increasing in the effort? Uh, you don't need to assume that. You could, but you don't need to. So I guess, what is the motivation for the firm to set a particular effort? Like, because you can affect costs. So it could be that by putting in high effort, you reduce costs. And so why not, think, why not, why not always put in low effort? The, why not put the effort and minimize costs? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, because I haven't told you the objectives yet. I, you know, the firm is oh, going to have a decision. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be the next slide. Yeah. So the effort is great. It means the firm doesn't know the effort. Uh, so it's gonna, so, so far it's the regulator doesn't know the effort. And then, so I'll just finish this portion of it. So the firm strategy is gonna map the observable history for the firm, right? The firm is gonna observe all the things in black. And also, of course, it's task effort. Uh, so let me just uh, get through the next two slides so that we have a little bit more structure and then uh, take a few more questions. So uh, I'm mean, gonna assume that the regulator is able to commit to its strategy. Now, as Laura will tell you, in dynamic mechanism design, commitment can be a very strong assumption. Uh, I don't happen to think that our solution relies that much on the commitment assumption, um, but that's a strong assumption we're making. Uh, the data generating process is the final element that I want to introduce on this slide. So this is D. This is the stochastic process. So like nature strategy, that's determining the customer's value from the product and the cost function. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to use the acronym DGP for data generated process, just consistent with you know, what we do in economics. Now, uh, two things I want to point out about this in purple. One is that the data generating process is exogenous. So no actions taken by the firm or the regulator are going to affect, say, the future value of consumers. The second thing that I want to do is sort of just stress that this is an unrestricted data generating process, right? So it does not need to be IID. It does not need to be Markovian. It does not need to be stationary. It's consistent with the adversarial model in online market. So, just yes. like, so I guess then, does this rule out the um, I think because uh, then we would not be exogenous. I, I don't think of yeah. So I guess uh, that's it, it is. I, I suppose that's true. That's not the way that I would have thought about the way that the model shuts down. So the quality investment, but but that that's fair. Yeah. Um, the thing that I'm really like trying to stress with this exogenous thing is you might imagine if the firm like consistently sets high prices, that different kinds of consumers will arrive to the market, and if you consistently set low prices. Um, next, uh, I just need to define the objectives for the firm and the regulator. So the firm's objective, profit, or what I'll call profit, it's going to be the expectation according to the true data generating process, or GGP, uh, time average of the following quantities, the revenue minus costs in green, plus the net transfers in purple, minus the disutility of effort, uh, to answer previous question, in red. Now, I'm including this utility of effort in the profit, uh, so maybe I should really call it the firm's utility function, but I'm just going to call it profit for convenience. Okay, so that's the firm's objective. The regulator's objective is what we'll call welfare, and this is going to depend on one of the parameters that I alluded to in the introduction. So this shadow cost lambda of public funds. Um, and the idea here is, as I sort of suggested, it's basically a shadow, um, sorry, a soft budget constraint. Okay, so the idea is, um, you, the regulator, can run a budget deficit in this market, but you need to finance that deficit using higher taxes elsewhere. Those higher taxes are going to lead to distortions and inefficiencies in those other markets. And so we're going to think about for every dollar of revenue that you need to uh, run this regulation, you're going to pay an additional social cost of lambda dollars. All right, so if you set lambda to infinity, then you basically have a hard budget constraint, which actually maybe loud I can, can, can address your question. <laughs> um, so, so we'll see that in a little bit. Um, uh, but typically, lambda is going to be much smaller. So in the empirical estimate that I gave you from like a 1976 JPE paper, the lambda was like 16 cents. The other thing I want to highlight is that this goes in both directions. So just as like the shadow cost exacerbates the uh, disadvantage of running a budget deficit, it's going to make it more beneficial to have a budget surplus, right? Because if you have a surplus in this market, you can use that surplus to reduce taxes elsewhere in the economy, and then you reduce those uh, shadow costs that you were paying before. Now, welfare, we can finally define its expectation given the true DGP of the time average of the following quantities. So in green is the total surplus. So the consumer's value minus the cost, uh, conditional on the product being bought, uh, minus the disutility of effort. So the regulator is benevolent and cares about the CEO being able to go to his kids' baseball games. Um, and then the shadow cost of transfers, which is in purple. OK, um, so let me know if there are any questions. Um, so is the value drawn yeah. from the distribution? The value is drawn from the distribution D. So the data generating process, which is a stochastic process that governs. The expectation. The expectation. So yeah. yes. um, and that's actually a great segue because um, you know this welfare depends on the DGP. Oh, just one second. Uh, it depends on the DGP. Of course, the regular of this model does not know what the DGP is. So what we need to do is quantify the uncertainty. Uh, of the regulator and sort of give you a notion of how to think about what makes the mechanism good and robust sense. And consumers are myopic. Consumers are myopic, yes. So they arrive once in the week. The firm needs long live, the regulator is long live. But even if X T is zero, I'm still paying that to C T right? So so this is not like I am saying that okay, I'm gonna provide you this service and this is my proposal and this is the cost and then you say okay yes or no and then I put in there uh, one F4 before anything happens and then that's right that's right uh, okay. so uh so one that's a great point um so yes yeah, so we are going to be thinking about um effort as in like I'm working really hard this week to make sure that you know all the factory workers are working hard. And then if we don't end up selling anything, that's just some cost. Um, the disutility of effort is just you know this quantity here. Um, and then the costs are 
So like when I put an effort, I don't necessarily know how that's how that's going to affect like the monetary costs of you know, producing the product. But did I have fully answer your question? Okay. Yeah, that was a great question. Yeah. So I mean it is really nice way of using the lambda, but I was wondering in practice, do you think it makes sense for it to be symmetric for like collecting and distributing funds? Um, you know, I I think it makes sense. I mean, that seems like a good way to understand you know, what are the trade-offs associated with running budget deficits or surpluses. And like one market is going to be small relative to full economy. So it makes sense to me that it'd be symmetric. Um, but if you have reason to think that it should be asymmetric, I'd love to chat about it afterwards. Okay. Yes. Still a little confused about the effort because if the costs are uh, non-negative, then nobody benefits from uh, any effort being <coughs> faced at all. So why wouldn't the effort always be zero? So uh, I didn't answer the question, but so let's suppose you have a choice between like putting in high effort or low effort, right? If you put in high effort, then the costs of production are going to be low, right? So you're going to have some high disutility of effort, but it could be outweighed by the lower net costs. Um, and if you put low effort, then you might have costs that are like perfectly fine. I see. So the costs are not monotone and cost of zero effort is not. The, but there's something yeah, yeah. implicit about the cost function. So, so I think also, I mean, saying it now makes me realize that maybe the, the term cost and so forth might be a bit confusing. I don't know if that's the case for you, but um, so there's like the disutility, which is how unhappy is the manager, and then there's the cost, which is physically how much does the firm have to pay to produce the product, right? Um, and so you're trading off unhappiness of the manager with like it being cheap to produce the product. Yes, you say it's a fixed cost up front to reduce market costs. Yeah, definitely. Sure. That makes sense. No factory. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the only thing is that those fixed costs, uh, so the disutility is not something to observe, whereas fixed costs are um, But it's a good one. Okay, um, so let me get to uh, sort of how does the regulator quantify the uncertainty? Basically, we're going to follow the practice in uh, online learning, which is to think about the regulator's regret. To define the regret, I need to introduce two ideas. First idea is an alternative. So we're going to consider a finite set A of alternative regulator strategies. Uh, in particular, we're going to assume that these, these alternatives are Markovian. So uh, here, we're going to assume that the transverse tau f and tau c only depend on the observations in the previous period. Now, um, there's a reason for this assumption. There's a reason for this assumption, right? The reason for this assumption is basically the typical reason in statistics why we don't want to look at a hypothesis space or class of experts that's too rich, right? The overfitting issue. Um, so this is like something that we just have to do if we want to take a statistical approach to this question. This assumption, I think, can be relaxed significantly. Um, it just makes our solution concepts a little bit more complex. It can't be fully relaxed, but you know, I think it can be relaxed uh, quite substantially. Uh, next, I want to introduce the idea of solution concept. Yes. The relaxation could it at least depend on the current budget deficit. I uh, need that. Yes. Uh, solution concepts. These are assumptions that we're going to be making about the agent's behavior. Uh, so what do I mean by behavior? I mean a firm's response function. A firm's response function is going to be a map from the regulator's strategy to the firm's strategy. Um, think about like best response as an example. So best response says, given the true data journey process, this is, you know, uh, I'm going to just maximize the expected profits. The firm's response is just a generalization, but right? more general class functions. Uh, solution concept is going to map the data generating process to a set of responses that we view as plausible in this particular setting. Um, so, for example, if we want to take a classical mechanism design approach, the solution concept would say, uh, well, given the data generating process D, we will assume that the firm uh, chooses a response that is the best response given that uh, distribution. And then finally, a solution to the regulator's problem is going to pair the regulator strategy, SR, with the solution concept SC. In other words, if we go to the regulator and we say, like, here's our solution for your problem, we need to do two things. One, we need to tell you what regulation we should use. And two, we need to tell you uh, what is the solution concept that we're using to motivate that regulation. And we'll impose more restrictions on the solution concepts uh, in the next section. Okay, finally, we can talk about regulator's regret, and then we'll be done with the problem. So the ret is going to be a function of the regulator strategy, the firm's response, and the data generating process D. It's going to be the difference between the welfare under the optimal alternative, if you knew the DGP, and the welfare under the regular strategy, if you want better figures. Now, of course, regret depends on, for example, the DGP. We don't know what that is. 
So we're going to think about regret guarantees that hold for uh, a given solution. Uh, this is going to be the regret and the limit as the number of periods grows. Worst case over data generating processes uh, and a worst case over from responses that are consistent with the solution concept. So uh, we're taking a very worst case approach, both with respect to the um, data generating process and with respect to the behavior. Um, and we'll think about an asymptotic result. Yes. Make sure I understand that the solution concept is itself worst case. Like the notion of equilibrium for this problem is something that would be the so, so the solution concept, uh, so we haven't said much about the solution concept yet, but it is going to be just some assumption about how the agent behaves. And then we're going to be worst case with respect to all behaviors that are consistent with that solution concept. But you're going to specify one in particular or? One solution concept? Yeah. Or uh, yes, we, we will. We will. Um, but uh, it will become clearer in the next section. Yes, so it, those data actually come video by video uh, from this uh, interaction. The data? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so what, what do you have in mind like at the video? So how often? So you regulate every day, every year. Oh yeah. So I'm gonna take a very like I take a very stylus approach, which is like every consumer that arrives is a new period. Okay. But you think about uh, generalizing that. Okay, so that's it for the model. Um, next I want to talk about the axioms, and these are going to um, basically restrict the set of solution concepts that we view as reasonable. Can you show me the examples of your so I think that that's why you were stressed so much that even though it sort of discompactly it looks like very stationary actually it's not it's like day one is almost happening way to the migrate response machine like all these shops are allowed for in the in the, in the way nature is selecting the data. Yes, I'm assuming correctly, yes. Okay. Um, and, and keep in mind, of course, when I say you perform well, I don't mean you perform well period by period. You know, if there's a shock, there's a shock, um, but you perform well in the long, which may be better than what we do in practice. It's, it's hard to say. Okay, axioms. Um, so the first axiom, there are going to be three, is consistency. Consistency says at a high level that even an expert firm wants to satisfy the solution concept. So even if you knew the DGP, it would be in your best interest to satisfy this concept. So precisely, uh, basically, um, there exists a firm's response within the solution concept for any distribution D. That is that the best response. Next, uh, it's the trackability axiom. So this says that even an ignorant firm can satisfy the solution concept. So even if you know nothing about the DGP, you're still able to sort of you know, find some algorithm that will satisfy the solution concept. Or it says that there's a firm response fee where the fee is consistent with the solution concept for any DG. Finally, uh, and this is the strongest axiom, best in margin, justifiability. Justifiability is going to be strong uh, restriction on the solution concept. And what it's going to mean is that our results are strong. Right? It's going to sort of tie your hands and keep us from throwing out or ruling out behaviors of the firm um, without like really good cost. So uh, verbally, we're going to say that we only rule out behavior that even an ignorant firm that knows nothing but the DGP can see it will be eventually dominated. Let me give you the definition more precisely. For every firm's response that is excluded by the solution concept for some distribution, there exists some deviation, P tilde, where the following three properties hold. First is that that deviation is consistent with the solution concept for any DGP. Second is that this deviation is no less profitable than the original in the limit as the number of periods grows for any DGP. Third is that the deviation is strictly more profitable than the original in the limit for the true DGP. So what does this mean in words? Well, one says that even an ignorant firm would be able to identify this deviation. Two says that even an ignorant firm would be convinced that this deviation is uh, going to be uh, leave them no worse off. And three says that actually they would have been better off. If they had to get <coughs> let me know if you have any questions about this. Yes. What is script D? What is what? Script D. Script P? I'm sorry, script D. 
Yeah. That's 50. It's a set of uh, all possible uh, data gen costs. Yeah. And uh, do you like say what that is? Yeah, it's unrestricted, so it could be any stochastic process. Okay, because I expect it to be a subset of all possible. No, if you're explicit about that, if you, you want to include it. Yeah, all okay. possible. Okay. Yeah. To clarify why, what do you mean by ignorant here for the firm? Ignorant means that the firm knows nothing about the data type process. Does not know scripty or does not know D prime? So D prime is just uh, sort of any whatever any abstract object. D is the true BGP, and so the firm does not know the true BGP. Yeah. Uh, and also, just the, the firm knows scripty, but again, scripty is just a set of all stochastic processes, so it doesn't require any knowledge. Yes. yes. And he's actually satisfied by natural solution concepts. Like, can you construct solution concepts to satisfy? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm increasingly thinking that I won't be able to tell you what the solution concept is, but I, I think of them as quite natural. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think I'll need to. Um, so the strategy, the so just in the strategy itself, the PGP is not going to enter. Um, so uh, I guess if the question is for like the consistency axiom, I need to talk about what the best response is, what optimality is. Um, and so there, I don't think it's going to be an issue. Um, but yeah, so, so I don't see that issue arising, but maybe we can chat afterwards and see. Uh, okay, so uh, just a quick proposition. It turns out that this third axiom implies the first two. So it's really much stronger. Um, but it's still good that we cover the first two and the first one will come up again. Okay, so main results. Uh, the results, I already told you what they are kind of, but let's use more precisive. Theorem one says that there exists a justifiable solution concept where the regular regret guarantee is this. And this is a coefficient that depends on the shadow cross lambda times the maximum value. So that's an upper bound on consumer's value. Uh, this, if you plug in an estimate of the shadow cross that comes from an empirical paper, uh, you will get that this is 14% of the maximum value. So the regret is at most 14 percent. The question is, of course, can we do better? And this leads us to theorem two. Theorem two says that there exists no consistent solution where the regular regret guarantee is lower than this weird function of lambda times the maximum value, which again corresponds to 11 percent under a reasonable boundary norm. So we could get down from a 14 percent to 11 percent if we, you know, look at consistent solution concepts. And keep in mind, consistency is a much weaker condition than justifiability. Um, but no, it, that's at most person. And as I alluded to earlier, I think you could probably bridge that. Yeah. How is the maximum value defined? Is it just a cost? The maximum value, which I didn't sort of mention earlier, but this is an upper bound of this risk value. Okay. The consumer spread was just in yeah. rate. So it's yeah. say like the. Okay. It's a scale. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Does that mean addition by the cost or? So that there's no bound on the cost of the effort. So somehow only we need to control the maximum value. There is um, yeah, I don't think um, I mean if the costs are super high, then uh, the best you can do is nothing, right? Uh, so I don't think we need any kind of bound on the cost. But yes, you have control over your actions as a firm, but you can't control your values. So, so um, let me say something that I'm not sure I understood that response, um, which is, uh, I, I might be repeating myself, um, but if you think about the cost of like, you know, producing a car to be like a million dollars, right, then you're not going to regret any given regulation because whatever you do, no one will buy the car, right? Um, so the market won't the same way. So uh, the nature of regret is that we only, as you know, right, we only care about, um, you know, uh, doing well in settings where it's possible to do well. Um, but happy to talk more afterwards to understand. Okay, um, so we're going to drop theorem two and uh, just think about theorem one. And I just want to, at a high level, tell you what the steps are that you need to prove a theorem like this. First step is familiar. We need to ask, what does the regulator do? In this case, we need to construct a strategy for the regulator. Then we need to ask, what does the firm do? So we need to construct a solution concept for the firm. Typically, in mechanism design, question two is like straightforward, right? We know, okay, the firm best response. In this case, we need to do a little bit more. Step three is the really interesting new step. 
we need to ask, so we asked, what does the firm do? And now we need to ask, how does the firm do this? And why should it? Now, economists were really good at sort of saying, like, why should a firm behave in a particular way? Right? We're really good at understanding incentives. And computer scientists are really good at understanding how do you accomplish something? Like, how can you actually come up with an algorithm that will achieve this solution concept? Um, and we can address both questions by showing that a solution is justifiable. Uh, finally, we can um, ask how well does the regulator do, which is lower bounding the welfare under the proposed strategy. And then we can ask how well could the regulator have done, which is upper bounding welfare under the regulator's alternative. Now, today, uh, I think we'll have time. So we'll talk about what the regulator strategy is. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to go through the solution concept, but uh, I'm happy to talk about it some other time or offline. Uh, and then we definitely won't have time to go through this. Sorry, well, yes. What does it mean to be justifiable? Uh, it's this axiom that I uh, oh, okay. mentioned for you. Okay, so regulator strategy. Again, uh, I basically told you about this in the introduction. Uh, it's customer first regulation. You have a tax and maybe subsidy. The tax is going to be on the producer surplus, which is revenue minus costs. The subsidy is going to be uh, based on the consumer surplus, which is just the um, uh, value minus costs, sorry, value minus price conditional on the purchase. The study is not quasi-linear, right? The, the regulator money is worth less than the other players' money, is that right? Because of the lambda effect. But the regulator, so money in the hands of the regulator is worth more than money in the hands of the firm. It's more. Okay. And the idea is that if you, if you get a budget surplus, you can reduce taxes elsewhere and reduce those associated restrictions. Uh, the net transfers for the firm under this mechanism are going to be something proportional to an estimate CS hat of the consumer surplus minus uh, something proportional to the producer surplus. Uh, the estimate has to be unbiased, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, OK, so just the thing to note is, of course, this will depend on lambda, right? Um, in the extreme case, where lambda is equal to 0, uh, the subsidy will be 100%, and then the tax will be 0. As you increase lambda, you're going to reduce the subsidy, and you're going to increase the tax. In the limit, you'll have no subsidy because you can't afford it, and the tax will be 50%. So you, you won't have a finite regret guarantee, but you will still get like a like 50% of uh, a notion of first best. Something like that. So you, you said this, I'm sure. What does the regulator observe? And why? So it doesn't observe ET, but it observes CTET? Yes, it observes the realized cost, but not the effort that went into it. So it can look into the books of the firm? Exactly, right. It observes the price and observes the sales. It does not observe so price so sales sales by of, of the consumer. Yeah, and so that's why you're Okay, so how do we get that estimate? Um, so the estimate is basically gotten by experimenting on consumers, but we're experimenting in like a light way. So we're experimenting in a way that's always better for the firm to the consumer to participate. So we're going to offer a randomly selected consumer money to not purchase the product. Uh, more precisely, what we're going to do is for every consumer that arrives, with probability epsilon, we will select them for the experiment. Then we will uh, offer that we'll decide on some quantity of money drawn uniformly. And then we'll tell the consumer, hey, if you don't buy the product, we're going to offer you that amount. Of what does this look like in practice? Well, think about you know, you own a home, you pay an election bill. Um, someday you get an email from your local electricity regulator, and they say, if you reduce your consumption next month by 20%, we're going to offer you $100. It's not that peaceful, in my opinion. Uh, the estimated consumer surplus is the following quantity, um, which I'll just leave out there for a moment, um, and say that the estimated consumer surplus is unbiased. Uh, Laura, how much time do I have? Okay, very good. So I just want to briefly talk about the incentives um, that this regulation offers at a high level. So the incentives for pricing are actually going to be efficient. So the firm's going to set efficient prices. And this is because this regulation aligns sort of the regulator firm's value from uh, an additional dollar of producer surplus with um, you know, their value from uh, additional one plus lambda dollars of consumer surplus. If lambda is zero, the prices will maximize the total surplus. If lambda is close to infinity, the prices will eventually maximize the producer surplus. And the idea here is that you know, their uh, value for money as the government is, is so high uh, that you know, what you want to do is generate as much of the tax revenue as possible, which comes from producer surplus. Um, and the way, you know, basically what you're doing is you're getting the firm to extract tax revenue. Okay, um, next, incentives for effort. These are not going to be as good for fundamental reasons. So the regulator and the firm are going to disagree on sort of the 
trade off between a dollar saved in effort and uh, you know, one plus hundred dollars of weighted total surplus. The firm will generally put in too little effort. Um, when lambda is zero, uh, that won't be an issue. We'll put in efficient effort. When lambda is small, you'll still put almost efficient effort. As lambda goes to infinity, we'll skip effort as long as the return on investment is below 100%. <coughs> Uh, you could improve in effort incentives by just increasing the um, lowering the uh, uh, taxes on profit, taxes on producer surplus. Uh, but that means that you have less money in your hands, which if lambda is high, then you value that that tax rate. Okay, um, so now uh, I will talk about the solution concept. I imagine I have like three to three minutes. Um, four? Okay, very nice. I think Lava's been generous, so thank you. Um, so let me just quickly talk about a solution concept, which is not the one we use, and describe why it is not good. That's it. okay. So you might be familiar with no regret assumptions. Uh, let me take a simple example to illustrate why these assumptions are not uh, good enough for our set. In period one, uh, you have a high value for the consumer. Period two, you have a medium value. Period three, you have a low value. Then you get high, medium, low, high, medium, low. So we're just assuming that this is the data gen process for the purpose of illustration. Um, we're going to assume zero costs to just shut down that problem. A first strategy is no regret if deviating to a fixed price P cannot improve the long run profits. Now, I wanted to show you a few examples of firm strategies and categorize them by whether they satisfy no regret or not. The first one is where the firm always sets a low price. Okay. And, well, you know, two thirds of the time, the value of the consumer is medium or high. So let's just suppose that the parameters are such that setting a low price is not. The best thing you could do, you prefer to always set a medium price or always set a high price. So, this is going to be a positive regret and it will be regret. Um, now, medium price always, that will be zero regret. We're just going to assume the parameter values are such that setting always a medium price is better than setting always a high price. So, here you have zero regret. This is, well, what it does. Third, we have the case where the firm appears to be able to perfectly predict the consumer's value. So, you have a high price, a medium price, and low price, high, medium, low, high, medium. Now here, you're doing like the very best you could with like a ton of information. Um, so certainly you don't want to fix, deviate to some fixed strategy because you'd be throwing away information. So here you're going to actually get negative regret and you're going to be consistent with your normal assumption. So this line here kind of looks like an ignorant firm that doesn't really know much about the data generating process, doesn't understand that it's like repetitive, uh, but they're still doing okay. This looks like a, a very well like expert that knows the data. The final example is the one that I want to focus on. Suppose that the firm every third period sets a low price, sorry, it's a high price, but otherwise sets a medium price. Now here, this behavior is going to satisfy no regret. The reason is whenever you set a medium price, you're doing just as well as the medium price always. And whenever you set a high price, well, even if you deviated to always setting a medium price, you wouldn't sell to low-value consumers anyways. Like so you're going to get no regret. But it's weird, right? It's weird because you know you like clearly you understand that every third period is different. From the other ones, right? Clearly, you can sort of understand there's something special about every third period, but you're using this information in exactly the wrong way. You're setting high prices when you should set low prices, right? So you have this information, but you're using it incorrectly. And that's what no regret allows, that we need to allow. And in fact, we can show that if you only assume no regret, um, it's not possible to get any kind of meaningful proof and a guarantee for the regular. So not only does this behavior look weird and irrational, but actually it's going to be pathological as well. Calibration is going to fix this particular issue. But it's not going to fix an other issue. And what does fix that other issue that I haven't told you about is counterfactual calibration. This is that other issue. So you can see. Uh, counterfactual calibration, uh, I'll not go through that. Um, but basically, this is a new solution concept that we developed in the Fox paper um, that uh, results in standard issues. OK, now I will conclude. Um, at a high level, how do I see this work? Well, let's go back 50 years and talk about classical mechanism design. I would characterize this uh, kind of work as leading to promising but fragile mechanisms. Promising because when they work, they work really well, but fragile because they only work in a limited set of environments. The best mechanism design, let's start about 20 years ago, is robust, it works in a large number of environments, but it's conservative, right? And it doesn't necessarily work particularly well in any given environment. Auction design is a special case. Auction design and robust mechanisms can work really well, um, but settings like is persuasion, uh, contract design, or monopoly regulation, generally you're going to have a significant loss of now. The idea of adaptive mechanism design is whether we can use data and new resources to get mechanisms that are both promising 
and the combust. So they work in a large variety of settings and they get good guarantees in all of those settings. In this paper, we applied uh, adaptive mechanism design to monopoly regulation and deliver foundations for what we call customer first regulation. Uh, there's some work to do. We need to tighten up the results, uh, get richer sets of alternatives, and uh, hopefully have something to say about the finite horizon problem. Uh, but more generally, I think this is an interesting framework. Uh, hopefully, it can give us some insights, uh, and I'd love to see it applied to other studies. Yes, sir. So I guess this is so you didn't actually say that the, so it could be possible that the optimal policy for the regulator actually leads to negative earnings. So it may be that the regulator has to invest in the product. Like put money into the well, I guess you, you do put money into the market in the sense that if you run a budget deficit, then you're putting money. But so what this is saying is even in that case, you're close to the uh, you're close to the optimum. So, in, so, so it's saying that like if your costs of funds are low, um, if you can tax very efficiently, for instance, right? right? Then you're, what's optimal for you is to put a lot of money into the market through subsidies, and then you get efficiency. Um, if you have more costly taxation elsewhere, then you don't want to put as much subsidies, but you still want to have some combination. Right? You still want to. Any about like uh, guarantees in like Baron Meyer fund? So it's like something like study that. Uh, yeah. So uh, Uni and uh, Go and uh, Aaron Schmeier have a paper. Maybe you know it about the West monopoly regulation. Um, so they're not taking the adaptive approach. They just say let's assume that the regulator knows nothing about demand and costs. Uh, they are assuming that the firm knows demand and costs. Um, but it's just a one-shot game, so there's no, no, no learning. Um, and then they show that, you know, uh, depending on how much you relatively value producer versus consumer surplus, you get some you know, robust version of uh, Baron Myers. Um, the idea here is, of course, that when we have a repeated game, we have access to additional data, additional information, we can uh, hopefully do better than just being robust. Yes? So you said consumer first regulation. <laughs> It's it's subsidizing people not to purchase the product. No, no, no. It's it's subsidizing the firm uh, to make the customers happy. So if the firm you know sets lower prices, for instance, that's going to make the customers happy because you have more consumer surplus, and we're going to offer the firm a subsidy that's proportional to the consumer surplus. So when we regulate natural monopolies, like uh, what uh, so uh, the kinds of regulations that I'm aware of are most like cost plus or rate of return regulation, where you're um, basically compensating the firm for the cost that it incurs. Uh, but if there are regulations that look like this, I'd be very curious. Oh, I see. So the, the it's, it's a way of how you get. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. Yeah. So in one case, you can say, well, you know, we'll just barely cover your costs. And the issue with that in this case is that if, the, you, know, if you just barely cover someone's costs, they're not going to have any incentive to put in that. Right. So we get a lot of firms with managers that aren't really you know, running the company. Yeah. So the the minimizing algorithms, the quality analysis is useful, and like I imagine, that's at least like. Associated to the customers, or the basis. I was wondering, you know, does this motivate another version? It's like, can we design all the algorithms satisfying your vision? Yeah, um, so what I would say is so two things one is for the regulator, the Actually, the regulation doesn't have to learn anything, right? As you, as you saw, um, the firm does have to learn. The firm does have to adapt, um, and we don't really study. Um, well, sorry. So, okay, so in principle, yes, you just observe you know, customers every now and then, uh, or like put together and put design examples. Uh, the rate of convergence might might be better, right? Um, and rate of convergence, finite sense of balance, and so forth. We haven't talked about at all. I'm hoping we'll be able to say something interesting about that. 
uh, and I think you might be able to, um, but uh, it will require uh, relaxing our justifiability axiom because that's inherently asymptotic. So we have like this trade off of like, if we want to say something finite sample, we need to make the solution concepts a little bit less like compelling for talks. All right, I think we can take the rest of the questions over the top here. Thank you. 